I have a very interesting guest with me today. Uh, he's a witty guy, a very talented singer. And he can make your hair stand on end. Um, he's a songwriter, and he sings with our worship team here at Partnership Christian Church, located on Highway 321 in Maryville, Tennessee. If you ever want to come visit with us, we'd love to have you. Uh, but my guest today on the Grind It podcast is Bob Motter. Uh, if you follow Bob on Facebook, you know exactly what I mean when I say he is witty. Uh, in in his cover photo, he's wearing a jester's hat. Uh, so he, he's pretty he's a pretty cool guy. He's, well, no, you're a really cool guy. Uh, uh, I embrace the wit. <laughs> but he, he, he is super funny. He can make you laugh. Uh, he's a realtor by trade, and he travels all over East Tennessee to sell properties. Do you want to tell him who you work for, or can we do that? Yeah, we can. I work for Coldwell Banker Wallace. There, there you go. So if you ever need to sell your house, contact Bob at Caldwell Bankers. Yeah, and we're starting our uh, TikTok presence. Uh, I've seen those. Up. I've seen those videos you've been making with that. With that. Is that one of your coworkers? Yes. Yeah, it's funny. Um, so, but he travels all over East Tennessee to sell properties, and, and one of the things that Bob likes to do on Facebook is that he'll post pics of where he's visiting and, try, and, and showing houses, and he'll ask his Facebook friends to try to, to guess where he's at. Um, Say, so how long have I known you? About a year, year and a half now? Yeah, so how long have you been coming here? I've been going here. Coming up on three years, actually. Oh, where have you been? Wait. <laughs> No, two years. <laughs> two, two, years. Years. two years. Okay, well, it's been two years then. Um, so I've known him for about two years, and I can share a personal story to give you an idea of what kind of, uh, of man Bob is. Uh, it's, it's no secret if you uh, watch the podcast on YouTube uh, that Nirvana is my favorite band of all times. Um, like I said, if you see them on, if you watch them on YouTube, you see the posters in my in my room on my wall. Several months ago, Bob shows up at church and says, hey, I got something to give you, and I'll bring it next week. And uh, so the next Sunday comes, and he brings me some deodorant. But it, and I, I think he was trying to say that I stink or something. No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> but it, it's not, uh, uh, it, it wasn't uh, a man's deodorant. It was actually a female's <laughs> deodorant. Um, but what made it so cool is uh, the deodorant is uh, is called Teen Spirit. And if you know anything about Nirvana, uh Kurt Cobain got that song uh, "Smells Like Teen Spirit" from actually from uh, this deodorant because one of his uh, one of his past girlfriends had a friend that that took a sharpie pen and wrote on the wall, "Kurt smells like teen spirit." And so uh, Bob had brought me uh, a little thing of teen spirit deodorant, which I have not used, by the okay. way. <laughs> but, yeah, I but can tell. It is in my room on my shelf where I can see it, so it's pretty cool. Because you, you should probably try other deodorant. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty rank on stage this morning. No, I'm just kidding. I was just shaking her playing. That's okay. Um, but but Bob Motter, he, he loves Christ. He loves to serve Christ. And as he's going to talk about here, I, I'm assuming, he, he loves to bless people with his music. And um, just real quick, you had an opportunity to sing for a, a, the lady. Who, she was 93, was she? 93 years yeah, old? Yeah, 93. Yeah. And, uh, and, and um, she was really close to death right when, and i think she requested you to come sing some hymns or something his, the, his her daughter asked if i could come sing at her memorial service and i said i didn't realize she had passed yet she said no she's she's still with us i said well why don't i just come sing for her now yeah uh and i eventually sang it was she passed a few days later but uh i thought you know why why not why wait well yeah let's uh, let's bless her now and just get her get her herself ready for her homecoming and so it was it was it was an honor it was, it was an, i know it touched a lot of people i think you had all, around 100 comments on that on that video and, uh, and yeah cool. i felt i almost felt like i shouldn't post anything i should just be something i do in uh you know what god sees in private you know mm -hmm. you know will be made public uh but i thought maybe it would inspire some people that they you don't have to change the world to change the world if that makes any sense yeah so it, you change the world by one person at a time right and i'm sure it's a huge blessing for the lady and, and well i mean obviously it touched even a lot more people than it did just her and her her daughter or whatever um, it touched a lot of people by the comments that was given all right Let's get into these questions, Bob, and we'll get this interview going here. All right, Bob, if you would, 
tell the grinded listeners a little bit about you, like where are you originally from, and and how did you end up? You're living in what Loudon, I Loudon, believe. Yeah. yeah. Um, I grew up in Ohio. Uh, Dad moved around a lot when we were were young. He used, was uh, worked for Debold Incorporated. They made safes and later ATMs and and whatnot. Uh, we ended up settling just north of Cincinnati. That's where I graduated high school. And I lived, got married, and then moved to Knoxville. Kids were born here. Roots started to grow in Tennessee. Did not miss the cold winters. So, um, How many kids do you have? I have three birth children, one adopted child. Cool. So, um, my youngest uh, just graduated high school and has started uh, going to uh, UT Chattanooga for nursing, so I'm super proud of her. Um, oldest son was when got out of high school, went into the Air Force for four years, worked uh, maintenance on the B two bomber, engine maintenance on the B two oh, bombers. Nice. Now he's working uh, security at the Federal Building. Yeah. Uh, my youngest son's working his own way through MTSU to get a business degree. He graduates this spring, so I'm super proud of that. And then my other son. Um, He's he chose the school of hard knocks and he's been uh, in in rehab and out of rehab. Uh, he, he he's staying clean for a while. Uh, he's out in California, um, and uh, you know it's been it's been rough on me. That's it's it. What's been hard is the uh, that it hasn't been hard to. To not speak to him for for a while, he, he I still love him dearly, right? Uh, but he he robbed me blind basically, and that's that's why I had to go back to work after I retired. Hmm. Uh, anyway, I don't want, you know don't want to dwell on that. I, mean, I I pray for him all the time. He needs somebody to save, you know. He needs somebody else to tell him the things I was telling him his whole life. Yeah, because yeah. it's hard to hear it from Dad and, and understand yeah. it. And I, I can't be the one to save him anymore because it's just uh, it's tough. But, yeah, yeah. I've, <clears throat> I've seen you know being a preacher for I don't know twenty years. I've I've seen and dealt with a lot of similar stories, unfortunately. And, and it's, you know, it's tough on your family. I met Ann. Ah. Uh, and uh, we became best friends. Uh, we were best friends for for a while, uh, and then I just, you know, I decided, you know, I don't want to be with anybody else. I mean, so uh, Christmas of 2016, I asked her, you know, to marry to marry me, and she said, of course. And so, yeah, we got married June 17th of 2017. Um, had a she was just my best friend mm-hmm. and uh, come she started having some uh, issues with her back she was she was a little overweight and so we thought she was just having back issues uh, spring of 2019 I think that's when I met you yeah because that's I was, when we first started coming here at, yeah to to, to uh, partnership yeah, because I, I was offering her my TENS unit. Do you remember that? Because mm-hmm. <laughs> I've had a three back surgery. So. And so, yeah, we went and we got, you yeah, know, went to the uh, orthopedic doctor, and this uh, she looked like she was 12 years old. The uh, doctor? Yeah, or the physician's assistant. I don't know what she was. But basically he, her comment was, you know, boiled down to you're you're overweight and you're old you're gonna have back issues deal with it here's right. here's some pain meds but we kind of pressed a little bit and uh said well let's get an mri done and so they uh we went and got the mri and she uh they said well yeah you you've got some disc issues but there's there's something else hmm. we need to that concerns us. We can see some shadowing on uh, your liver and your pancreas. So we had uh, CAT scans, ultrasounds, all the all the different tests, and 
can't remember. She even went to the gynecologist to have some things, some procedures. Um, and all in the meantime, running all these tests, everything. Oh, your blood, white blood cell count looks good. Everything's fine. Breathe the sigh of relief. We went. She had earned a three-night stay at a resort in Scottsdale, New Mexico. Hmm. Scottsdale, Arizona, excuse me. And we decided, um, instead of flying, let's drive. Let's let's see some of the country. So we took it three days to get out there. Took Route 66, saw the Grand Canyon, saw the Four cool. Corners. Uh, then planned a whole different route on the way back. Went through Roswell, New Mexico. Found the, the house where her parents got married in in Grand, Grand Prairie, Texas or something like that. Wow. Uh, visited a friend in Dallas, then cut through Louisiana, and, uh, and about a week or so after we got back, we I was out showing houses and got a text from Ann said, I have cancer. And uh, I dropped what I was doing, told these people, I'll find someone else to help you if you need, I need to go home. And... Uh, that's what I did for the for next little while was take care of her. Yeah. Um, but thirty nine days later, it was a very aggressive cancer, and uh, uh, so she passed on July nineteenth at five oh five a.m. But uh, when we are. I would play music for, even there were times where she was just basically unresponsive, you know. Um, and the the doctor was asking me if I should put her, we should put her on the comfort care instead of trying to get her to the point where she could start getting chemo. And I said, I'll, I'll talk to her next time she has a lucid moment. And the doctor says, I don't know if she's going to have any more lucid moments. Mm. And I was just, I was devastated. Uh, and I was just, she would basically, every once in a while she would moan about where it hurts the most. On my legs, my back. Um, and I was just, I was in tears. Um, because, you know, I may never speak to my best friend again. Right. You talk. And I looked up, and she was smiling at me. <laughs> and I walked over to her, and she goes, I just wanted, just woke up thinking about how much I love you. Mm-hmm. And God says he's going to take me home, but it's going to be okay because it's just going to seem like a short time before we see each other again. That's awesome. And I said, I don't want that. She goes, don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. And just like that, she was back to my legs. It was that lucid moment, the speaking to my best friend moment that God gave me. That was a gift to me Absolutely. to let me know that I it was going to be okay. And so we don't grieve like those who have no hope. Right. So I was able to. That was a definite one of my top two God moments in my life. I grew up um, Catholic, um, went to church faithfully, was an altar boy, um, and uh, but you know it's my parents' faith that I agreed to. You know I'm, I'm okay with all this. Um, but if um just got out of high school uh my uh I was a little a couple years out of high school it was my bro- younger brother was in a college um theater troupe and he said hey bob the the leads the lead for this musical we're doing dropped out do you want to do it oh wow and i said oh, i'll think about it okay and it was um it was a musical godspell if you're familiar with it at all it's basically the book of matthew put to music that's cool and i said 
I'll think about it. And I laid down in my bed and put the eight track of the soundtrack of. <laughs> if this, that tells you how long ago this was, it was, was mid eighties. And I felt somebody shake me in my sleep, and I sat up, and there was nobody there, and the song "Prepare Ye the Way Lord is Playing," oh. and I thought, okay. I guess this is my sign that I should do this. So basically for a... Was he looking for John the Baptist? <laughs> so basically for a month, you know, I dug into this, uh, learned my lines. Apparently I learned everybody else's lines because they, they told me to stop mouthing everybody else's lines <laughs> while I was doing this. But I was memorizing the book of Matthew and the stories and the gospel, and I was thinking, wow... This Jesus is radical. I like him. Yeah. So this is what it, you know, this is what I've been learning. This is, okay, I get this. And the, the final night uh, I was being crucified. Uh-huh. I was being tied to a, a plywood cross. And I'm thinking, man, I'm mildly uncomfortable up here. Man, I don't even have nails. I have not been whipped. I'm not, it just, and just, just like a flood, it just came over me, you know, what Christ had done on the cross for me. And I just started bawling, and people thought I was the best actor. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was real. None of the, all the females in the cast, um, they just started crying. And the guys were, like, trying to carry the final song. Yeah. Uh, so that was well, that was also one of my number one God moments, where where my parents' Jesus became my Jesus, and to this day I can, if you play this Godspell soundtrack, I can sing all the songs and and, and just feel it again. Um, and it was about that time I was also started a band with my brother and a couple of our friends because we wanted to tell girls we were in a band. All right. And so we can meet girls. And then they started asking us, can we hear some of your songs? <laughs> and so we went to the basement. We recorded. Uh, we made up some songs. We had one of those, uh, you know, Gandhi's best friend. <laughs> um, we sang about the open sign at the Pizza Hut. And, you know, oh, just man. all these. And we came up with one called Surfing the Dead Sea. And it just got weirder and weirder. And then we invited a, a keyboard player so we would actually have some music right. to go along with our songs. And we, we started picking some up, more stuff up. And we decided to learn our own instruments. And That's where you, Is that where you, you started the mandolin? No, I didn't buy a mandolin until I got down here in Knoxville. Into the mountains. <laughs> Into the mountains. <laughs> Stereotypes, uh, I had a huh? keyboard. I didn't. I don't know how to play piano. I could. I can make someone who doesn't know how to play piano think I know how to play piano. All right. But I just had a keyboard, that. and it was the '80s, so I made synth- synthesizer sounds. <laughs> and we started. We started playing out actually, and we started getting better. And it there was probably in the evolution of the band. The cult. We called ourselves the Uninvited Guests because we like to go to parties, right. and uninvited and inspect people's kitchens and what that taught me was I had I had a knack for putting coming up with clever lyrics putting melodies to melodies to these lyrics um, and just recently and we the band broke up in 89 when I came to Tennessee to be an air traffic controller um, and almost 30 years to the day of our last show, um, a, one of the icons of the Cincinnati music scene died suddenly. And so they, they were doing a tribute concert for him, and they were getting all the bands from the 80s back together to, oh, wow. to do it. So we actually, it was scheduled for July 20th of 2019. And they had else that they knew I was staying back with Ann, you know. Yeah. And I didn't let I didn't decide until 
the morning of July 20th. It was the day after Ann had passed. That I was going to go up there and be with those guys and oh, wow. and do that show. And it was pretty cathartic for me. Um, it was a little weird, too. Um, I, I mean, I was still in shock. But, um, but she told you to... Right to keep playing, or yeah, keeps, she, keep singing. Basically, she told me if I didn't use my music to continue to make, use my music to make the world a better place, she'd come back and haunt me. Yeah. Um, and her, one of her last words, she was like I said, she was I played had headphones with her, so she was listening to music. Um, and her last word. And we weren't even expecting it. We, she, we had to visit. I was talking to some visitors, and she was listening to Zach Williams' uh, Chain Breaker. Oh, yeah. And uh, she said, testify. <laughs> and I've used that as her command to me, her, her charge to me to, to continue to um, write music. Um, kind of evolved from when I came, when I moved down here. Didn't really do anything with my music for a while. I wrote a handful of songs here and there. Never really did anything with it. Uh, raising kids yeah. and, and whatnot. Being a dad. Being a dad. I'd pen. I'd pen some stuff. I'd make re- crude recordings of them, but they'd just be sitting, you know, on the jump drive somewhere. All right. Um. And then. Uh, we were driving back from Ann's mom's funeral, 2015-ish, and we were just talking about, you know, what our regrets would be if we, you know, what would your regrets be if you passed, you know, what would you wish you would have done? I said, all my music die up in my head, no one would ever hear it, mm-hmm. and uh, she said, well, let's fix that, and uh, hooked up with a a great guy, Steve Rutledge, um, runs, uh, it was called Steel String Studios at the time, but now it's the Groove House Studio here in, uh, in Louisville, Tennessee. And, uh, we, uh, we hit it off pretty good. He, we, we, I would tell him, this is what I want. And I'd sing this thing and he would just, say, okay. And then he would, he would hear what I heard in my head and then make it five yeah. times better, you wow. know, and the first one we recorded was a country song I wrote about raising boys um, uh, basically you know I got inspired for it when my my son was probably 10 or so and I said oh yeah he does this and this uh, other mom said oh yeah that's classic ADD <laughs> and I said it's not ADD that's just B-O-Y and so I wrote a song based on that hook. Um, wrote, I've written quite a few praise and worship songs. I always want my songs to be um, inspirational in a way. Um, I was a Boy Scout up until my 18th birthday. Barely just missed being an Eagle Scout. But one of the things they always taught us about a campsite was leave a campsite better than you found it. Right. I want to leave the listener's spirit in a better place than when I found it. It doesn't necessarily have to always say Jesus. Yeah. It can be a funny song. It can be a heartwarming song. Um, well, I, I know I, I, Bob was interviewed by WVLT, a local news network here in, in Knoxville, and uh, and I was watching it uh, yesterday uh, it's because uh, you did a Christmas album, right? Right, because Anne, Anne loved Christmas. Yes. And so I wanted to, I'd written several Christmas songs, I had, well, three decent ones, and then, then did a cover of a, a rocking cover of an old Christmas carol. So, uh, yeah, I was trying to think of that one that was so funny. Back uh, I, the, the Beer Humbug. Yeah, you know? Beer Humbug, that's it. Yeah, that was, <laughs> I wrote that one for my brother, basically. He, <laughs> Um, he hated the hype of Christmas. He always, if Christmas music was on before Thanksgiving, he'd always he'd want to change the channel. It was, you know. But I wanted to write something that was for someone who doesn't like the hype of Christmas, but didn't yeah. still love the baby Jesus. Um, so I made it more of an anti Santa Claus 
So, <laughs> so the, the guy ends up at the bar every Christmas Eve because his wife ran off with Santa Claus. Um, but yeah, and it was 2017. I I hooked up with a group called uh, Kingdom Songs. I'd been uh, friends with the guy, the kind of founder of it, uh, from some Christian songwriting um, uh, message boards since the late 90s. And so we'd known each other, Michael Fair and I had known each other for almost 20 years virtually, but had never met. Finally met him um, in the fall of 2017. Um, and he's he's been a big time. You, you know songs he's written, he, a lot of Lauren Daigle stuff. Um, That's he's cool. written for Reba McIntyre. Wow. Um, his first big song was uh, Let It Rain that Michael W. Smith uh, did, and that just kind of brought him to Nashville, and he's been kind of a, a mentor to me. And it was basically a collective of worship leaders would come and learn how to write songs for our church. And uh, I've made some good friends uh, across the country. I've written, and they, they bring other um, songwriters in there. And it's basically a big, you learn techniques, but also you get together and write songs together. Right. And so I've a lot of the songs that are going to be on uh, the Christmas, that Christian album, I'm going to release at some point. <laughs> Uh, were written there. I, I, one I'm particularly excited about is called. Uh, now I can't remember the name of my own song. <laughs> <laughs> the one is called Invincible. Um, we got together with Matt Armstrong and Kate Thompson. Kate Thompson's a young, up and coming artist. Matt Armstrong has written a lot of so he, he, wrote, he wrote the co-wrote the song Love Rain Red that we sang at church this morning um, and a, a, another worship leader from Georgia named Amy Carlock and we wanted to write something that uh, Cade wanted to write something that you know for the youth for maybe youth rallies and kind of thing like that so we thought you know kids already today think they're invincible you right. know because you're young and nothing can hurt you what if we really trusted in God you know, you know, what would it look like if I stepped out in faith, followed your voice and walked out on the water, you know? What would it feel like to run out into battle, to face a giant with a sling and a stone, you know, those... Like David, yeah. And so that one's come about pretty... I like that, the way that one's turned out. And there's there's a handful of ones. Uh, the first one I wrote was with... Uh, a uh, worship leader from Louisiana, Drew Lye, and a, a musician from Nashville, Scott Dota, called You Are Home. And it started out as a um, a call for the prodigals to come back to church. But I sang it once at a, a, a competition, and uh, Steve Rutledge's wife heard it and said, well, you sing that at my dad's memorial service. Oh, wow. And it's really just taken. I've, I have sung that at a half a dozen at least uh, memorial services now. And it, 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 it's taken on a whole new life that way. Um, you know, unfortunately, I, it, you can find these songs on Reverb Nation, but they're, they're not mastered. Uh, none of the... the just raw get, recording. Well, they're, they're they're studio recordings, but they're not mixed and mastered quite the way that we're going to release them. Um, but hopefully, I'll have something released soon. I mean, you can find what's it Christmas under Bob Bob Modder? Modder yeah, uh, at Reverb on Reverb Nation. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I want to get some of this this music out, and because uh, I, I plan on writing more. Yeah. Too. Absolutely, I know you can belt it. But you know, I, I am. I just trying to be faithful with what I have. Um, 
to testify. Right. And this, you know, God gives us talents and, you know, there's the parable of the talents and what we do with them. You know, if I sit and bury them, mm-hmm. you know, he's not going to trust me with anymore, you know, and like with the, 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 the woman I sang to, uh, before she passed, you know, I need to be faithful with the sphere of influence God has given me before I expect him to give me a larger sphere of influence. I write the songs for him, whether they become famous or popular Absolutely. is up completely to up to him. Absolutely. I, I guess it reminds me of a story I, back in 2005-ish. I went to a worship seminar in uh, Nashville, or Franklin, really. Uh, it was right when Here I Am to Worship came out by Tim mm-hmm. Hughes. Oh, yeah. And I went there, and I'm sitting there, and he's leading worship, and there's a these other, couple, couple other young worship leaders up there, up-and-comers, and, and uh, I'm thinking, what am I doing here? I'm a middle-aged man. <laughs> I have no business here. Let these young pups do what they need to do. And I actually went out in the lobby, and I was feeling sorry for myself. And I walked by. I mean, I sat, was sitting there, and I saw this woman walk by. And that looks like an old Russian lady. And soon enough, there was a whole gaggle of them. Uh, gag, I think that's the official term for a group of Russian women is a gaggle. Um, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, one of my – the pastor, the uh, assistant pastor that came with me to the, this event said, oh, yeah, those look like Russian ladies. And he knew that I had been to Russia on mission trips. And I knew how to sing in Russian. Oh, wow. And he, he said, hey, do you mind if Bob sings you a song? I said, okay. Well, I got my mandolin out, and I sang uh, All Who Are Thirsty in, in, in Russian to them. Sweet. And the, they, they were touched by that. They were, and it, I was riding home from Nashville, and I heard God tell me, I didn't prepare Tim Hughes for that moment. You worry about, you don't worry about what I've called Tim Hughes do. You, you do what I've prepared you to do and be faithful with it. And so ever since then, I, you know, sure, I'd like for my music to touch lots of people. But if it touches just the right people, that's all that it needs to do. I just need to be faithful and sing for who I need to sing to. If God takes my voice away tomorrow, so be it, you know. Um, I'm just going to be faithful with what he's given me thus far, and just I can't expect him to give me more until I you know, do what I need to do uh, with what I've been given. So, right. I know, talking about God using you and all, um, and how I, at the beginning when I was introducing you, and I brought up the the ninety three year old woman that you sang for, and you just mentioned her again. Uh, I know that uh, you do the as a smule is that the name of right, yes, the sir. app where you sing with friends, and and you sing with some pretty big names on that. I've seen right, and there's a there's more to it than that. It looks like. Um, the Smule app is basically a karaoke app. You can sing by yourself or you can sing duets with people where they sing half the song and then they put it out there yeah. and hope somebody joins them and sings the other half of the song and sings harmonies or whatever. And I started doing that at the pandemic uh, at the beginning. And I, I just threw one out there. I sang Jackson with some uh, some woman that I don't know. I don't know. And it got kind of a good reaction, so I, I threw a couple more out there, and it was uh, it was fun. And just people said, "Oh, I look forward to hearing your songs mm-hmm. every day." You know, and I would just sing happy, you know, fun things. And uh, some I know there, some of them you, you dress up and right, you yeah. do funny stuff because you're a witty guy, as I mentioned. And uh, one of my friends said, "Hey, can you sing Bridge Over Troubled Water?" I said, "Yeah, I love that song." That I mean, that Simon Garfunkel album was, my parents wore that out. And it was, that was the album that made me really love music. I love Simon Garfunkel. So, yeah, I can sing that. So I started scrolling through, and I kind of auditioned people. I hear them sing part of the song. Eh, that's not going to be a good mix. They're a little flat, you know. I do my own 
person of Simon Cowell. Yeah, no, this won't work. <laughs> and I saw this one woman, a uh, paramedic. She was dressed up, and she started singing it. And, man, she could sing. And her name was Carrie Underwood with a K, K-E-R-Y. And she was a paramedic in North Bay, Ontario. And I thought, yeah, I'll sing with her. And so recorded it, thought it sounded pretty good, posted it. And people just loved it. It got hundreds of shares. It ended up with over 30,000 views on my, my Facebook page. Um, it went basically semi-viral up in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. And so I've got, I've got lots of Facebook friends in North Bay, Ontario now that they want me to come sing once the uh, That's cool. pandemic is over. Which, sure, why not? I've never been to North Bay, Ontario. So... Yeah, let it warm up a little bit. <laughs> so, so I did that for quite a bit, uh, and now they some famous singers go on there, and they they put half the song on. And so, what I would do is I would dress like them. Yeah, like Darius Rucker was wearing his South Carolina Gamecocks hat, so I <laughs> and a, a black T-shirt and a black jacket. So I wore a black jacket, black T-shirt, but a Tennessee Volunteers hat. And would sing the songs with him, and uh, he doesn't know I exist. But you know, uh, my one duet with Gary Darius Rucker has over thirty thousand views now too, so as awesome. well. Uh, you know, I drank, sang with um, Seal, and Ed Sheeran, and most recently was uh, Matthew West. Hello, my name is dressed like him too, and. So, I feel like I know him. <laughs> he doesn't know me, but that's okay. Yeah. I, I love him both, uh, enough for both of us. But uh, it's funny how God could take those Facebook singing with friends, smeal right. karaoke things, and people know who Bob Mater is, and then they go search for Bob Mater, and then they find your other music work right. that you've written that's about Christ. And you, you never know when somebody's going to, and they may already have come across those songs yeah. and, the, you know, and those messages. And my name you, is still Mater, by the way. Did I say Mater? You said Mater a couple times, See? So that's okay. See? It's, it's my grandfather's it. fault, actually. You're stuck with it. The, uh, but, but you never know how God's going to, and, and that, that's one of the reasons why I do these interviews is because I, I want people to hear people's story that, that to know that the struggles that people have, how God brings them through, but then when God brings them through, how God can take those hard times in our lives and and help it be a blessing to other people. Right. Yeah, and I'm working on a song. Uh, well, I wrote it actually driving back from Ann's memorial service. I wrote the music for it the night before a service, sitting alone in a bed, couldn't sleep composed it on my iPhone mm -hmm. and then just uh, I like this music and then played it on a loop on the way home wrote the words um, you know though you slay me I will trust you Lord you know you know using scriptures well, of course but it's, it's you're, you're still so good to me regardless of what I'm going through I want mm, the pain I've been through that I can understand that other people going through. If I can speak truth and life into situations where people are hurting, then I don't want I don't want my suffering to go, you know, to waste. You know. So when we first started the interview, you were talking about your kids and and. Um you were talking about a, a son who's going through, I think you said, the school of hard knocks. Right. Uh, obviously having um, some um, uh, issues with, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Addiction. Yes, addictions. Thank you. <laughs> it just escaped me. Uh, and, and there are, you know, a ton of people who are, are who have children who they hurt because they're, they see their loved one and not even just their child, it could be a family member or a best friend or whatever, and they see them struggle with these addictions. And, and what the people who are going through the addictions don't understand is how it affects everybody else. And, and 
we've heard you talk about Anne and your love for Anne, and she was your best friend, and and obviously you you miss your best friend, mm-hmm. and, and 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 you love her, and uh, and you look forward to day of being with her, and, and obviously there's you know people who's lost loved ones um, in 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 their lives that they love very dearly, like you love Anne. Mm-hmm. So that's a little bit about your story. And wh- what what words of encouragement would you give the grounded listeners that would help them if they have a loved one who is uh, uh, suffering with an addiction, who's struggling with it, and and um, and they try to help them, but they maybe can't find the right words, or they kind of just at their wits' end because they're they're tired, mm-hmm. um, or with that in mind and someone who has lost a loved one um uh to cancer or whatever reason and and they're just grieving um because they miss their loved one right and so i guess that's kind of like a two-part deal right there. and i may catch some grief for this but i was you know going through grief you know counseling or a grief support group um, after Anne passed, one of the big things was that oh, it's all part of God's plan. And I said, I say no. God's plan was us to live to Him in paradise forever. We chose to live in a world with disease and drugs, hurricanes, earthquakes, famines. You know, because of sin. We chose the sin. We chose that. Yes. This, but God does still have a plan for us to to live. Uh, with him for eternity Mm -hmm. and he's made a way for that and I'll get to that and I'll circle back to that Uh, but not everything is God's plan I mean things but God can work all things together for our good Um, I'll never say Boy, I'm sure glad my wife died of cancer because all these good things happened to me afterwards. Right. Um, that's that's just not how it is. And, and you can have faith. You can do everything you think that is right to raise a child, and they can still turn because they they make their decisions. And the the scourge the the of drugs, the the power, the addiction, where. The next high is more important than the people you love. Because I know he loves me. Yeah, absolutely. But the chemical imbalances in his body the that crave this euphoria, this fake, you know, this fake peace, mm-hmm. um, throws that out the window. But there's a real peace. There's a real... Uh, you know, it sounds corny to say get high on Jesus, you know, because it's not the same. Um, I, I can't say. I've never actually gotten high. Uh, but I've been drunk. And it's, it's actually not all that as much fun as I thought it would be. Especially when you get too drunk and you're puking your guts out and right. passed out and everything else, I, right? I've said I always, if I want to have a good time, I want to be able to rem- remember it the next day. Yeah. I, I've, I've done the same thing, so I, I, I kind of... So, I, you know, I, I made mistakes as a parent, but I, I can't let it... It's... But who hasn't? The, 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 the evil of this world that we live in, the, these addictions... Um, you know, and anything that takes a place ahead of God uh, or, you know, the people we love, whether it be, you know, blasphemy to say, you know, Tennessee sports or, <laughs> or Alabama sports for, for that matter or, you know, your car, your job, your money, right. you know, that can be an addiction as well that, you know. So I struggle with my own things. You know, I get obsessed with, you know, music, or I get ex- obsessed with, you know, trying to, you know, to do things. Um, and I don't consider whether, you know, if it's edifying God, you know, glor- edifying 
my brothers and sisters in Christ or anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but I need to find people where they are, help people. If I've been down a path and I can help people through that part of their life, then I need to do that. Just like um, people help me, you know, when when struggling with, you know, my son or, or struggling with grief. Um, God brings us through things to help others through it. Um, and like I said, not all not all roads lead to God, but there's no road that Christ won't walk down to find one of his own. Right. So I'm praying, you know, for my son that Christ will find him on the road he is on. Um, and anyone who is out there that just needs, you know, some encouragement, some love, um, if you're going through something, you know, I'm on Facebook, send me a message, you know. I'm, I'll be glad to help what I can, yeah. you know. And you can email email me at uh, grinditpodcast at gmail dot com, and I'll make sure that Bob gets the message and he can he can respond back to you in any any way that he can. Um, would you want to pray for our listeners who are, have loved ones suffering from addictions and who's lost loved ones and are grieving for mm-hmm. their lost loved ones? Sure, Father God, you are. Jehovah Rapha, God our healer. And you can you can touch people's lives. You can bring healing. You can restore physical bodies. You can restore health for those who are suffering from addiction, those who are, you know, struggling with cancer or any other disease. Um, just by the, the touch of the hem of your garment. I pray for anyone who's listening now that is that is feeling the weight of the world, that is feeling um, despair, feeling uh, like they can't go on, that you would not just give them the hem of your garment, but give them a full-on embrace of your healing powers, that you of your your mercies new every morning. Give them hope. Give them joy. Put people in their lives that will speak your truth and draw them near to you. We thank you for everyone that may be listening. I thank you for Randy for inviting me to do this. And I just pray for your peace to dwell in our country, in our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate your time. Thank you. God bless you.